listening to Why the Truck. Hey, the boys are back in town. Michael Vincent had to yeah. stop by the studio today. Back together. You had to come in today. It's awesome to see you, man. How it, are you? It was, you know, I had to come in. I've, I've been watching a lot of our content. I've been seeing those cool bugs that you guys may have noticed that pop up. Like right here on the bottom of the screen, you see yeah, like yeah, Anthony yeah. Smith and Zach Strickland or you pointing at the, the forecasting sign. And I was like, we need to film some of those. So we made a put that coffee down one and we made a uh, one for what the truck. Yeah, we did. It's just yeah. a, just this morning. Yeah. They're kind of cool, but it's kind of weird, you know, standing in front of the green screen. I guess it's a blue screen actually yeah. here at Freightways. Yeah, it's, <laughs> we it's used, a bright light. We used a blue screen, but it's kind of funny to do those. So I used to do improv at the Improv Asylum in Boston. I did it for oh, okay. a couple years. I graduated from the Improv Asylum there. And uh, it was fun doing those skits downstairs because it, it reminded me of being back like doing doing improv. It's a good time. By the way, guys, yeah. we got you up on the uh, the LinkedIn comments, the social media over here. So join the conversation. Have fun with us. We'll enjoy it. Uh, let's see who who this show is courtesy of. Who we got this week? Right Pilot here Flying it is courtesy. J. This episode is brought to you by Pilot Flying J Axle Fuel Card, right which on. provides the credit you need with fast approvals and money back. There are no transaction and fees and no monthly fees. So sign up for yours today at AxleFuelCard.com. Axle Fuel Card keeps fleets on a roll, subject to credit approval. And terms and conditions may apply. They always do. <laughs> those darn terms and conditions. Yeah. By the way, I don't have my soundboard with me, so we got to do, oh, do, do our transitions oh, acapella. Okay. So, All right. Do, 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 do. Headlines. 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 There you go. What's in the news today? By the way, Sheena Davis says, welcome back to the studio, Dooner. Hey, Sheena. Thanks for, <laughs> yeah. It's it's nice in here. Nice and chilly. Nice and, nice and air conditioned. It is. It's nice and chilly in there, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Headline one. California approves world's first electric truck sales mandate. We're seeing a lot of traction in this space now. You, as you guys know, if you listened to our episode a few weeks ago, we had Trevor Milton on from Nikola. I believe last Friday we were talking about even more going out with Nikola. Well, this is a big boon for them and all other electric truck manufacturers. Yeah. California regulators have approved a mandate requiring truck manufacturers to sell an increasing percentage of electric vehicles by 2024. The rule is the first of its kind in the world. Finally, America being back to a leader. Uh, original <laughs> yeah. equipment manufacturers, though, OEMs are leery. Will startups, Tesla, and Nikola back the standard? Makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a shocker, right? I, I, <laughs> no, Nikola and Tesla are against this standard. No, but in a highly anticipated vote, Dooner, so 12 members of the California Air Resource Board, CARB, obviously, unanimously approved an electric uh, mandate, electric truck mandate that will require medium and heavy duty truck manufacturers sell an increasing percentage of zero emission vehicles starting in 2024. The advanced clean truck uh, rule, the first of its kind in the world, as you said, sets out different sales targets based on the vehicle class. By 2035, about 75% of all class eight big rigs will be, will need to be, that are sold in California will need to be uh, electric. So that's uh, so more than 150 people testified. I imagine on both sides of this. this yeah, thing, a couple right? comments too. Jacob Ruina he says, uh, interesting that Tesla announced the announces this as uh, the factory in Fremont will increase production. Uh, as this legislation comes out, yeah, I'm sure they had a big part in that. A little inside info, I, w- I would think. Kendrick the Third says the boys are back in town. No more love sack views. And uh, <laughs> William Bailey says love the hat. Yeah, this is a uh, from a company called Mr. Porter, and it's a take on monsters in my pocket. If you're a '90s kid, you will know what that is. Uh, so this is good news for a lot of people, except for OEMs. OEMs are weary. They have a lot of a lot of products in 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 place, trucks in place. They do. Dawn Fenton, she's the director of sustainability and public affairs for Volvo Trucks. She told the board manufacturers that. She doubts the market's readiness to absorb the volumes of this regulation. Now, it's it's, it really, it's only four years out, so not a long time. Full deployment of Volvo's electric truck pilot in Southern California has been delayed due to a lack of charging stations. That infrastructure is still a problem. Well, the coronavirus downturn has negatively impacted the heavy-duty truck market and eroded public funding intended to support incentives and zero emission vehicle projects. Everyone blaming the coronavirus, even Queeby. Queeby saying people not watching short videos on their phones because um, because of coronavirus? they don't have enough hand- time on their hands. <laughs> Fenton asked the board. But they to don't ins- have enough time on their hands. That's what they're saying, man. Uh, okay. Fenton asked the board to insert a provision into the regulation to ensure truck manufacturers are not deemed non-compliant. If they don't meet sales requirements, she says, we asked for a rule based on realistic success rather than unrealistic expectations. What do you make of that? I mean, to push these initiatives through, you have to have regulation because what else would incentivize companies to do it? 
Well, I mean, they, they've tried, you know, tax incentives and that yeah. type of stuff, right? So they're trying it with regulations. But if they do it without being deemed non-compliant, if you don't hit those numbers, what? Why? Why do you have the? Why do you have the rule? But I, yeah. I think there's 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 solid. Don Fenton's got solid solid point. The infrastructures to support those vehicles being sold and on the roads has got to be there too. You can't just say we're going to sell these, but there's nowhere to charge them. Yeah. You know, no, yeah, I mean, that's fair. That's completely fair and valid. Uh, we are seeing the market mature, though. Like we said, Nicola yeah. has their trucks coming out. If you see the beautiful Anheuser-Busch Nicola truck that oh, was look on the thumbnail for the right, show. Right, right down there. Oh, right down here. Right yeah, down we're going to be yeah. talking to uh, we'll, we'll talk to Angie Slaughter from there in a bit, too. We are. We are. That, that's going to be good. That's going to be good. But it, it, how do you enforce this regulation anyways, Duder? I mean, it's saying that 75% or better, whatever it is, of sales, right? Yeah. So that means that purchasers and, and sellers are 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 both on this so if, if yeah. you're if you're buying a large if you semi decent large fleet in, in California and you buy 50% of your trucks in 2035 uh non electric yeah are you now going to be nailed for being non compliant or do you are you forced to now I have to buy this more expensive truck given if they are more expensive that's where it gets murky and and you got to figure that the 2020s are going to be a bridge period for electrification of trucks automation of yeah. trucks all those kind of things we're probably going to see electric trucks mature by the end of the decade where automation will probably be by the end of the next decade yeah when are you getting your pickup when's your pickup due for delivery cyber you know? truck as long as elon doesn't blame coronavirus it'll be next year but he's not into coronavirus. He's not blaming a coronavirus. No, he's no. not. He's he's using it to, to leverage California a little bit. Yeah, he is <laughs> a little bit. So next year. They're building those in Texas, by the way. Gigafactory. Oh, is that Texas, right? Huh. The ground. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, cool. Second one. You no, know he's back in the news is uh, is Arkansas Mo. Trucking he's company. back? Yeah, trucking company owner. He's indicted in this PPP loan fraud and a Ponzi scheme now added on top of this. Uh, federal oh. investigators have charged Reality TV, an owner of a trucking company with bank fraud and money laundering, alleging he misused funds meant to help small businesses stay afloat during this COVID-19 pandemic. Prosecutors allege that Maurice Fain, he's uh, otherwise known as Arkansas Mo. I don't watch oh, his okay, show, yeah. though. He's 37. I He's of Dracula, Dracula, Georgia, not Dracula. <laughs> Dracula, Dracula, from Dracula. Dracula, Georgia. He appeared on VH1's reality TV show, Love and Hip Hop. Um, <laughs> he applied for these, what we covered before, is he applied for the Pay Tax Protection Program, right? He applied for the $3.7 million loan. And uh, in mid-April, his trucking company got busted, though. Remember, they? it was, if he got like 1.7, and I think they weren't investigating anything under $2 million, that's how he came up in our last story. And yeah, like, he wow, got like, he, lucky. yeah, he wanted $3 million or so, or applied for $3 million, and he got like two point. Two million thirty thousand or two million fifty thousand. Yeah, well, so what he does here with all this stuff is he goes out and he uh, he's in, they're investigating him because he used the money to purchase expensive jewelry. He paid back child support. Well, that was nice of him, and he leased a uh, Rolls Royce. Yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> and we never did go out with our metal detectors and check his to see what else was buried out <laughs> that there. Fortune's but, out there somewhere. <laughs> it is the fortune is out there. People are searching right now. I think six have died. When it was a guy in Colorado that would hit this stuff. But <laughs> Fain, he, so Fain was also charged with wire fraud in connection with a Ponzi scheme for twenty individuals in where f after twenty individuals invested five million dollars in flame trucking. But investigators claim he used investors' money to pay his personal debts and expenses and transferred more than five million dollars to a casino to cover his gambling debt. He was arrested in May on federal bank fr uh, fraud charges arising from the PPP loan. According to the original complaint filed on May 12th, Fain submitted a PPP loan application with United Community Bank, UCB, headquartered in Blairsville, Georgia, which is a small business administration lender. Yeah, he, he literally like robbed Peter to pay Paul here. Yeah, he did. He stated that he was very generous. And if, if this was true, it's not true. But if it was, he said he had 107 employees and his monthly payroll was 1.5 million, which I think averages like $160,000 <laughs> yeah, per employee. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. generous if you want to go work for Arkansas Mo. But he got busted. None of it was true. He spent $85,000 on the custom jewelry. Uh, he gave $230,000 to associates to help him run a Ponzi scheme. And then he even helped out a buddy. He gave an additional $907,000 to help an associate start a new business. So, I mean, at least he spreads the wealth out after he stealing it. Yeah, he spread him around. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. seized his stuff. Um, we are running, we got to call Brian Schreiber. So oh, real okay. quickly, the DHL su pricing power supply chain index that has jumped up to 50. It's a balanced market. Very huge recovery. And if you remember, there was that great debate at Freight Waves Live in in May. And it was like, well, who will win, Craig or Zach? Is it going to improve? It was, and now there's no debate whatsoever. I mean, they, the volumes have improved. Er, er, things are looking good at the moment, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Craig's prediction was was absolutely correct. He did lose a debate, though. Yeah. Two different things. But he lost a bet, but, or he won the bet, lost the debate. But yeah, they're 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 skyrocketing right now. And the only question is now is does industry and the consumer uh, support the fire that's already been lit? Right. Uh, there's a lot of pull forward on industrial and things that are moving. It's all consumer and stuff like that. Industrials is not picking up all that all that well. But when, will it? And will it continue to support this when the PPPs run out, et cetera? So all this we'll and other headlines happens. at FreightWaves.com. Go there after the show to get your latest news. Read that DHL supplying supply chain pricing matter index. Get the full story on everything we covered and everything else. But right now we're going to call Brian Shriver. He's the managing he's the manager of air cargo business development at Columbus Regional Airport Authority. Let's dial him up. Yeah, that's right. It's also uh, what he's your. It's Ricky Bacher. What is he? Ohio State alum. Oh yeah, yeah, he's a Buckeye. He's a Buckeye. All right, let's see. We're dialing him up right now. We're going to talk is. to him about what's going on in air freight markets. Catch up on what's happening in the uh, the what's it called? What are we at now? Summer, summer of 2020. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. What, hey, Brian, what, uh, are you there? It's still June too. It's almost July. Brian. Yes, I'm here. How hey, are you Brian. Guys? Thanks for joining us, man. We were just talking about uh, we're talking about air freight, talking about you coming on the show. Michael Amen. Vincent was saying, "Oh yeah, he's a great guy because he's a Ohio he, State. He Buckeye. is OH brother. I O brother. <laughs> there you go. We're hey, gonna... so uh, dude, what, what's um? We talked to you about a month ago. What's air freight looking like now as we move into the summer of 2020? What are you seeing from your seat over there in Columbus? Uh, the, the PPE, the personal protection equipment pipeline, still pretty strong, but uh, we're seeing some of uh, some evidence that that's kind of starting to wane. But with the resurgence of the virus, it, you know, this could continue for quite a while. It's amazing how just the bulk of personal protective equipment we see coming through, and we're only one airport. It, it's quite amazing. Um, as far as the general air freight market, um, rates out of Asia are coming down a little bit. We talked about last time the capacity constraint of taking all the passenger planes out of the skies caused, you know, supply and demand issues and freight rates went up. They're starting to ease up. And we're seeing a lot of uh, converted passenger planes carrying freight strapped into the seats and sometimes with the seats removed coming into the airport in Columbus. Yeah, that's interesting. So you're starting to see some of those converted planes coming into, what is it? It's Rickenbacker, right? Correct. It's Rickenbacker International Airport, uh, named after a World War One flying ace, not the guitar guy. <laughs> yeah, we covered that. Uh, we covered we cover that. that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure it's a freighter-only aircraft, uh, freighter-dedicated airport. Uh, it's not like in Chicago or JFK where you have the mix of the big global passenger airplanes. But we're seeing some of those passenger airplanes. And as a matter of fact, I think we're approaching about 30 of those flights. We're getting about two a day of uh, passenger airplanes, the big ones, uh, coming out of the Middle East uh, with PPE mostly, but also with some regular air freight, uh, either strapped into the seats or uh, coach class seats removed and loaded onto the floor. Hey, Brian, with new outbreaks across America, opening up has been a challenge. A lot of Americans getting antsy getting back. I'm hearing some reports that that air freight volumes are improving in terms of people getting back on on flights. What are you seeing there? And what's your are you optimistic about the long term uh, outlook of of the industry of air, of air freight? And are, passengers are an important component to it, right? Because of the belly cargo. Correct. So 50% of the world's global air freight capacity actually resides in the belly and the cargo holds and baggage holds, if you will, of passenger aircraft, and particularly on the long haul international routes. So most of those are shut down right now globally, and that automatically takes uh, half of the world's air freight capacity out of, out of service. And those are a lot of business routes. So the leisure industry domestically, let's say in the United States here, you know, people are antsy. They're wanting to get back to Florida or go somewhere warm, get out of the house. That's coming back quicker. But those long, uh, big plane business routes are, are going to return more slowly across the globe. So I think it'll be elevated air freight rates for quite some time. So uh, we we reported on on freightways dot com and uh, about uh, like you said the the changes that are happening or the, the I guess the rates that are coming down in at least Asia to uh, to uh, U S and to and to Europe they're they're coming down but they're still quite elevated correct yeah they are um, comparatively but um, some of the shippers that normally would be really averse to those high rates because their their product is low yield or low margin. Um, they're starting to kind of wake back up, and a lot of that's consumer sentiment driven. And they're seeing, okay, maybe the air freight is tolerable, but it's definitely not normal. 
Yeah, because some of them are still quadruple uh, and, and double and quadruple what they were before. I mean, you know, ten dollars uh, a kilo is is not a good rate, yeah. <laughs> right? Right. Oh, it is compared to a month and a half ago. But oh no, yeah. Wait, <laughs> at a flat time, we're talking two fifty a kilo in that lane, probably. Yeah, yeah, it's it's better than twenty five dollars, but it's not two fifty. <laughs> hey, Brian, right. you're very familiar with with FTZs, free trade zones. For people who aren't, what are those, and what's are, are people utilizing uh, things like FTZs during this pandemic, more or less? How how are they utilized? Um, our FTZ, so number one, they're they're designed to keep jobs in manufacturing and production in the United States. So it's not really about letting somebody out of fees and taxes or a company out of that. It's uh, designed for, you know, bringing your product into the U.S. duty-free, meaning the, the customs office doesn't levy a, a, a tax against you when they come in. And if they leave the country, say they go to a distribution center in Columbus, Ohio, and they go up to Canada to retail stores, they it's like the product never entered the United States, so they never pay those duties. So ours is, and there's some oil and gas implications as well for that. And so ours is um, primarily retail-driven. We've seen the retailers were shut down, so I would say our actual activity in the foreign trade zone lightened up a little bit. But the whole global um, trade war-type issues that have been going on for the last year and a half or so um, have actually really sparked a lot of interest in FTZ, and our, our new leads are running at the highest level ever. Yeah, so you know, Brian, when you when we're talking about the belly cargo and and some of the, and you've got some converted uh, passenger planes that are now moving freight and that type of stuff, I imagine that uh, I mean, there's a million different questions that go through my mind from the efficiencies of unloading those versus you know regular freighters. I'm sure it's a, a little bit more difficult, uh, especially in in a place like Rickenbacker where that you you don't usually do belly cargo. You're all freighter mostly, but really, but here here's a question that I want you to think about, and and hopefully you can answer. Or give me your thoughts on this is so now you've got all these passenger flights that have have been canceled some of them are coming back and some of them are being converted to freighters right now when when this hit obviously shippers that use air freight and the air cargo business was hurt dramatically because of capacity now the, the rates went really high but and the airlines passenger airlines were hurt but the freighters weren't really hurt they were enjoying record stuff you know record record prices shippers were hurt yeah. how hard is it going to be for those air Airlines that relied on that belly cargo as subsequent revenue to support those flights to get that back uh, when passengers start flying again. I mean, you, you know, people don't want to get, you know, I would think as shippers, they don't want to get, uh, you know, caught with that. Right. I mean, I think I know what you're asking. And what's interesting is, well, first of all, that capacity will come back as the passengers come back. And unless there's a sea change in the way they configure airplanes, um, they used to run these things called combis where there'd be half passenger, half freight. Um, if, unless those come back, that, that belly capacity is not going to come back until the passengers start flying around the world again. And that'll be totally dependent upon, you know, how long this outbreak goes. Do we get a, a vaccine? Uh, when do business travelers feel comfortable traveling again? So it's really a, it's a dependent function of the passenger travel. Hey, Brian, a lot of people, like a lot of the financial media is blaming Robinhood for airline stocks being being held up and supported during these times. But I think that there's some optimistic investors that are looking at the, the airlines right now and seeing a, a good value. Would you, would you agree with that? You know, if we have a V-shaped recovery and, you know, in the leisure market, we're starting to see that. Uh, we, have a, we have a leisure carrier out of Rickenbacker, as a matter of fact, called Allegiant, and they were the very first to rebound. So, um yeah, I mean, you look at the stock market in general, and you've seen, and maybe even in your 401k, you've seen that V starting to take shape. It could potentially be too late to invest in those airline stocks. Yeah, my, my Robinhood hasn't really been hit at all during this time. It was for that brief period, that like two weeks in March, and it, it's, it's as strong as ever. I mean, it's weird how the markets have not, didn't completely collapse. I mean, I, thankfully they didn't, but um, it, I'm glad they've been staying buoyant through these times. Brian, how do people reach out and learn more and take advantage of all that you guys have to offer at the Columbus Regional Airport? So I work for uh, the Columbus Regional Airport Authority, which oversees three airports in Columbus, Ohio. But my primary function is at Rickenbacker International Airport, our freight dedicated airport and associated logistics structure. So um, you can go to RickenbackerAdvantage.com, and you'll find information on us, and you can find my email and contact information there. Thank you very much for joining us today. Get that, RickenbackerAdvantage.com. Take it easy, Brian. Uh, you got a Thanks, Ohio Brian. State cheer for him? 
<laughs> well, I'm not going to sing the whole thing, but okay. All right. <laughs> Fight All right. the Maybe team across time. the field, my friend. Well, our next segment is a play it forward one where you're going to play some. <laughs> I guitar. could sing uh, Carmen Ohio for him, but Carmen Ohio? Where <laughs> yeah. in the world is Carmen San Diego? <laughs> hey, no, we're going to call now. We're going to. Oh, we have a couple comments first. Luke Davis says, "Can't wait to hear from John Brewer on fast food logistics." John is very loyal to his carriers. Tough to find someone more collaborative than John who values partnerships. NTC, oh, yeah. yeah, awesome, wow. Luke. He's going to be up go. in uh, in about ten minutes here. Matt Hennig, uh, any relation to Kurt Hennig? He says, put on some overalls and you're 85% of the way to the hillbilly gym look. <laughs> Getting there, man. Kurt, Kurt Hennig is uh, Mr. Perfect. Do you remember Mr. Perfect from yeah. WWE? Yeah, I do. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Brutus Beefcake at WrestleMania 6. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's, call, uh, let's call Frank McCabe. Awesome. Frank McCabe, he's, uh, he, he understands transportation law and all that stuff. He's, he's going to do some play it forward for us. He's going to play the bass. Yeah, that's going to be sweet. Dialing out of Danbury, Connecticut. My wife's from Connecticut. Very familiar. Can't wait to get back up east once this pandemic dies down. Go back I up got north. relatives up in the Connecticut area. Yeah, get nice. see some people. Get up there, get some lobster. Hopefully, Frank is uh, tuning his bass as this is dialing right now. Hey, Frank McCabe, this Hello? is Dooner. Hey, Frank, this is Dooner and the Dude on What the Truck. Thanks How you doing, Frank? Us. What's going on? How you doing? We're, we're doing great. We're really happy to have you on the air. We know that uh, you know we talked about this Play It Forward initiative. We've really been enjoying hearing some of the talents of the uh, the people in supply chain. You being one of them, you reached out when I put that call to action there. And anyone listening, if you are in supply chain, you play an instrument, just follow me or or, the, or Vincent on right. LinkedIn. Connect with us and just send us a comment, and we'll see about getting you on the air. But uh, did, do you have your base with you? Uh, yeah, I'm actually uh, pulled up my short stage rig right now, so. Uh, I've got it ready to roll. All right, dude, man. Right. Play, play us uh, like 60, Let's 90 hear. seconds. Yeah, no problem. I'm going to play uh, uh, gonna play a little Mama Kin from Aerosmith. All right, try and mix it up just a little oh, bit for, uh, for the, uh, the, the the content ID. A little Mama Kin. All right. <laughs> All right, hold on. Here we go. Tune it up. Good job, Frank. Good job. Actually, man, how long have you been playing bass for? Uh, officially, uh, about 10 years. I, uh, I started out playing guitar as a kid, and uh, several years back was in a, a band, and our bass has left, and uh, I was a rhythm guitarist, so I just kind of said, hey, it's all the same stuff to me. Let's do it. So grabbed the bass, and uh, a good friend of mine gave me uh, some uh, gear that he had, and uh, been doing that ever since. Nice. And what do you do for in the supply chain? You, you do some legal kind of stuff? So I have a good combination of uh, my background is as an attorney. I've litigated. I started litigating transportation cases um, in the early 2000s. And then about 2013, I transitioned. I went in-house as a general counsel for a national uh, white glove shipping logistics company. And um, then I got promoted to president. So I've got operational knowledge as well, which is kind of Come in handy as an attorney when you uh, get into some of the quagmires that exist in our industry. All right. Now, so this isn't to one up you or anything, but Michael Vincent, oh. he, right before we went on air, he was in the studio backstage shredding his guitar. And I think that my we had a secret camera on him from our video team. If we could roll that tape of, uh, of Michael Vincent, let's see how he uh, how he pairs up against Frank. I, I w- <laughs> Thanks, man. Appreciate that. <laughs> now, I understand this is a take on the Trey Briggs play. It is. It's 
Duner and the dude. Yeah. It just jazzed it up a little bit for us. By the way, guys, okay. talk about face melt. We got some t-shirts maybe in the works. Well, that's good yep. stuff. So what do you make of that, Frank? Do you think you could, you could think you'd come up with a baseline to go along with that one? Uh, you know, I probably could. Um, <laughs> uh, that's one of the fun things that I get to do every now and then is, is to uh, mix it up with stuff. So uh, about a few weeks ago, I had a, a friend of mine up here who's um, – trying to put out his own hip hop record and he, he wrote a whole track and he said, I feel like I want a real baseline. And he shot me the track and uh, worked on it for a few days and we ended up sitting in and laying down a baseline. So we're waiting to hear what that comes back from the uh, production team with. Um, but it was a lot of fun. It was uh, definitely a new experience because I've never really uh, jumped into hip hop before, but yeah, good time. <laughs> well, sweet. Well, based on your 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 playing of uh, of can I say mamakin? <laughs> uh, uh, a, um, a inspired what what you an inspired version inspired by uh, that was pretty spot on, and I can rock that tune too. We got to get together and rock a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, hey man, so playing the bass is tough, but so is litigating cases. So what's the uh, what's the toughest case you've litigated, or, or what's the biggest problem in transportation people don't really know about? We hear a lot about nuclear verdicts, but what's maybe something that I don't know transportation executives need to be thinking more about that you really want them to to focus and key in on? You know, for me right now, uh, it's kind of a few key things. One of them is always maybe contract contractual terms. One of the biggest nightmares that I've seen in my career has been where you have a good contract in place and a shipper or, you know, if you're working with a broker or someone else, something changes in what they're looking for. And rather than trying to work the deal out through the contract itself, they uh, there's a lot of times where people think they can just break a contract. I know a lot of times in transportation you'll have in that, that contractual clause that, uh, yeah, it's a 10-year contract, but you can cancel on 30 days' notice. So most people assume you've got a 30-day out provision. Um, but you really got to focus on whether or not that's actually there. Cause I've had cases where we removed that and you end up in litigation, uh, when you really don't need to be there. Um, so I, I would say, you know, really focus on what's going into the contract, make sure that everyone is on the same page. And really before you start dragging lawyers into the mix, sit down at a table and have a good conversation and figure it out. Um, it may sound strange coming from a lawyer, but truly I hate litigation uh, because it means you're ending something very, very harshly uh, in terms of a relationship with uh, another company. Um, the other thing now is, is going to be safety. There's a lot of safety issues going on, but maybe the biggest one is as we go into this post-COVID-19 world, um, I think we've got to start looking at an industry as to how do we maneuver on uh, bills of lading. Um, I know we've got truck drivers who have been doing such a phenomenal job um, during these hard times, making sure all of us have things like food and toilet paper and everything else that we want that we can buy from Amazon. But, um, you know, no one, no one often stops to think about what risk those folks have when they pull up through a distribution center. they got to get out of a truck. They've got to go into places. You know, I think we've got such great technology that finding the right way to transition everything to an electronic DOL in a way that would be compliant with the FMCSA requirements would, uh, would definitely be – you know, something we need to look at, and I think the people that can figure that out are going to be really at the forefront. That's going to speed up a lot of transportation uh, times. It's going to make things a little more streamlined at the docks and, and just keep everything nice and easy. So yeah, you, you talked about the BOL and the, and the compliance with the FMCSA and, and, and that type of stuff. For it, Whether it's digital or, or paper form, it's got the same language on it, right? So is it really just a matter of the uh, legality of a digital uh, print, uh, a digital uh, 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 print of the signature? Yeah, that's what, that's what a lot of it is. You know, when you get, when you get stopped for a, a road check with the DOT, they want to see paperwork. Um, and you think of it like what they had with insurance cards for auto insurance. Yeah. Um, you know, there were a handful of states initially. I live in Connecticut. It was one of them. Um, I got stopped. I didn't have the updated insurance card. I pulled out my app and I showed the cop and he said, uh, okay, just, uh, just so you know, we don't accept that. Um, and they've recently changed that in Connecticut. But I, I think it's just getting the right authorities on board with accepting and acknowledging that the electronic document is just as good as the paper document. Um, and especially when we have things like in the white glove and the final mile realm, you know, an electronically signed POD is absolutely acceptable. Um, so why, why not have the same standard applying for bills of lading? Uh, and that way we can just uh, get this stuff rolling and keep these guys maybe a little safer and uh, make their days a little easier. 
Frank, that was that was amazing advice. And uh, I mean, yeah. I really like a lawyer that says, like, don't go to to trial. I mean, <laughs> you're talking to a biased source, but he's very trusted. But trials can take forever. Look at that TQL thing. That's starting in 2010. It takes forever. Frank, we got to call uh, John Brewer. But uh, how do people reach out and continue the conversation with you? Uh, definitely reach out. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm happy to talk to anyone about uh, just about anything, whether it's uh, rock and roll or trucks. So nice. uh, right on. feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I am uh, always looking to meet up with some new folks and have some great conversations. Thank you for your time today, Frank. We really appreciate it. Thanks for playing it for. By the way, good guy. Yeah. He uh, at Walnut Creek Ch- Community Church in Bethel, Connecticut. He he does work at their food pantry over there. He said lines have been it's longer than ever. It's one of those things. You don't go to a food pantry, you're not going to see that kind of thing. Yeah, you don't you understand and, it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, and a lot of people still struggling. <laughs> Almost lost my <laughs> <Apparently>. microphone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's easier at home. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, who do we got coming up next? Introduce our next. Well, yeah. Uh, so John Brewer, director of distribution and logistics at. CKE Restaurants Incorporated location is Spring Hill, Tennessee. But we're talking about what are we talking about? It's Carl's Jr., right? And he's, Hardee's. He's, CKE Restaurants is Carl's Jr. and Hardee's. If you're right. not familiar, John Brewer, you're on the you're on the line with Dooner and the Dude on what the truck, man. Thanks for making your first appearance with us here. Hey, appreciate being on. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. Uh, hey, by the way, yeah, a yeah, we got in the you. comments here. Uh, let me let me scroll back to oh, Luke Davis. He had really kind things to say to you. He said he can't wait to hear from John Brewer on fast food logistics. John is very loyal to his carriers. Tough to find someone more collaborative than John who values that. So Luke Davis with uh, Transco Lines, very big fan of yours. I imagine you have a lot of them. You've been a uh, you've been a little bit of a celebrity this week. I've been seeing you on a couple different shows, Johnny. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's it's been pretty busy. I've been to every minute of it. Uh, it's, it's been interesting. Um, I've had a great time doing it. I uh, love, uh, love talking to Chuck. University of Memphis Tiger alumni, too. Yeah. A couple of famous notables, Derek Rose, you know, Isaac Bruce, yeah. Damsel Williams. Yep. But my favorite, Jerry the King Lawler. Jerry Lawler. Hey, John, he, he, he broke uh, 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 Andy Kaufman's neck, nowhere. right? He did break Andy Kaufman's neck. <laughs> he broke that. He's been on WWE Raw. Very long career out of the King, Jerry. Yeah. Lawler. Very well known in that. They that probably Memphis have a area. statue at the, the University of, of Memphis. Uh, Memphis. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so John, how do uh, how do fast food supply chains work, especially in during a pandemic? Now, I mean, we have a lot of questions about that whole uh, scene. Well, um, it, it's been kind of interesting out there, as, as everybody well knows. Uh, we are in the QSR business. Uh, a bulk of the bulk of our business is through, was through drive through pre COVID anyway. So our drive through has grown exponentially during this time as people uh, get out and uh, get parents' meals and their kids' meals and, and take them home and eat them. So uh, we've actually fared pretty well through this whole thing versus the uh, casual dining market. So it's, um, <clears throat> it's definitely been interesting to say the least. What about the shipping side of all this? Like, we were seeing the consumer recovery, and I totally understand. Like, fast food, drive throughs make perfect sense, especially if you want to do the social distancing. There's probably no other restaurant industry that's already, like, they already have that in place, which is the, the fast food. It's, like, a perfect medium for a pandemic. But how does that shift, like, the, the sourcing and the distribution of all this stuff? Uh, the, the distribution side of it and the uh, transportation side of it have been pretty nimble. Uh, they, they've really uh, recovered and come back. Uh, the manufacturing side is a little bit different, so... Uh, you've, heard, you've heard some uh, meat plants closing down over the country, so we've had to really, uh, really source that uh, very carefully. Uh, typically, bringing in more than one vendor to source it, uh, just to cover all our bases. So it's, it's been a challenge, but uh, we're coming out of it. Uh, we're going to see, you know, the protein come back into the market, kind of like you see in the grocery stores, and we've been able to take care of our customers. So it's been it's it's been hard, but it's been a we're actually seeing daylight at the end of the tunnel, so that's good. So your supply chain is, is I mean, it's outside of the grocery store supply chain, right? And it, it is it, so is it in the restaurant supply chain? Or are you, are you uh, I mean, it's, you're delivering specific things to your specific stores, right? So is, is it going, how does that supply chain work? Does it come directly from food distributors? Or are you, con- you know, are you, you congregating that stuff and aggregating it and then bringing it into those stores yourself? We actually partner with two different distribution partners, one for each brand. Uh, we bring in manufactured products uh, proprietary to us into their facilities. Uh, they use their own dedicated fleet of drivers, and basically what it is, is it's about a 12 to 15 stop pedal run. They're running uh, three zone reefers where they have the drive uh, refrigerated and frozen. 
and the driver's actually hand trucked that off the, the trailers um, on two wheelers inside delivery. They'll put the free frozen in the freezer and the uh, chill in the cooler, and then the dry in a designated area. And what's really interesting is, uh, especially on the fall side, a lot of our deliveries are uh, unattended. The driver goes in at night, uh, he, he has a key, he has the alarm code, uh, he delivers the load, and then he locks up and puts the alarm and he's off to his next stop. So it's, it's definitely different than the grocery side of the business. Oh, wow. Hey, with, with, um, with all these trucks moving around, right? You, you have so many, so many d- disparate locations all over the place. Uh, how big of a factor does cost avoidance play into a transportation company like yours? I'd imagine a lot with that many trucks and that many miles. Absolutely. Um, we're always looking at different ways of doing things on that regard. And we're just trying to, uh, uh, one of our biggest things that we really try to focus on is, uh, food obsolescence. Uh, Obviously, everything has a shelf life to some degree, so we want to get it sold before we uh, before we get past that shelf life date. So that's a, that's a challenge for us, but we definitely manage it. Uh, we'll move products around the system. If we have a promotion that's doing one well in one area of the country, but not so much in the other, we'll move uh, inventory from one lo- from one uh, geographical area to another just to make sure that we have the uh, precious product out there and it, and it doesn't go to uh, so bad before the end of our promotion. So you, you, you mentioned that the bulk of your business was uh, drive through pickup only. Are you seeing that remain, or is it a higher percentage now? Are you opening? Are you in, in states where, where people are getting out, moving around? They're, they're not under lockdown anymore. They're out getting them moving around. Are you seeing that even higher now? We, we have opened some restaurant dining rooms in, in the states that permit it. Uh, obviously, we're we're uh, adhering to social distancing protocols and uh, doing the PPE and all that. Our drive-through business has, um, after the pandemic really hit, the, the drive-through business grew and it's still continuing to stay pretty high. Hey, how do you how how does your team decide, or how does how does CKA decide what is a Carl's Jr. and what's a Hardee's? Is there like a a line of demarcation in the the middle of the country? How does that regionality break out? Typically, there's not. Um, Carl's Jr. is obviously more West Coast based, uh, and Hardee's is more Midwest and Southeast. So, uh, if you, a rough line would probably be the Mississippi River. However, we do have stores that traverse that river both in both directions. So I'm I'm interested. Uh, uh, Carl's Jr. and and Dooner pointed out that there's actually a Carl's Jr. Jr. There was. There used to. I like. There used to be. Right? There was when I lived there. <laughs> what happened to Carl Senior? Was there a Carl? Why did it come out Carl Jr.? Do you know the story behind that? The the former owner of uh, Carl's. Was his name was Carl, and it was Carl Carter Enterprises and CKE, and he named his restaurants Carl's Jr. Wow. Okay. Yeah. They were, you know, Carl's Jr., one cool thing about them is they had like the $5 burger in the early 2000s, and they were sort of introducing at the, at the time, inflation has happened, but at the, at the time it was sort of like the higher end version of a yeah. burger you could get at a fast food restaurant. And it was it was delicious when I when I lived out there. The oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Hey. So, anything, any, uh, anything that would surprise people about the the fast food supply chain that we that they may not think about or know about or take for granted when they go through the drive through. One thing that uh, I've been with the company a little over three years, I've uh, been in the industry a little over twenty five. One thing that I found extremely interesting about both brands is people when they think of the brands, they think of them as comfort food. Uh, Big example of that would be um, during hurricane season on the eastern seaboard with Hardee's. As the storms would pass through, the sales of the stores would go through the roof because people were actually grabbing burgers and stuff for their family on the way out of the out of the uh, um, area to get away from the storm. And the same thing holds true with this pandemic. I mean, it's you know people people are looking for normalcy. People are looking for comfort and. And Hardee's and Carl's Jr. seem to bring that to the table where some other brands may not. Yeah. No, uh, uh, delicious and, and, uh, and, and sensible. Hey, John, we, we, have to, we have to let you go. But if people want to continue the conversation with you, uh, you are a, a great guy to talk to on LinkedIn. How do they go about doing that? Uh, just send me an invite. I'll be happy to talk with you, uh, you know, whatever you want to discuss. Nice. Go. Yep. John Excellent. Brewer. He doesn't bite, he, but he has great sandwiches with Carl's Jr. over there. John, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you having me on.
He's got not only does is John a wealth of knowledge for being in the in the industry, but I find that that especially with two restaurants, you know, with with the the Carl's Jr. Hardish band, how brands. do you decide how that how do you distribute how you distribute those kind of things? Uh, even like the factories and the manufacturing and all that kind of stuff. How does it all come into play? Yeah, the, the separate branding and everything. But it's it's regional though. They don't cross regions, right? No. There aren't Carl's with a with a Hardee's in the same exact region. No. So I mean, that would help logistics a little bit. By the way, we're calling Angie Slaughter now. She's the VP of Sustainability yeah. Logistics, SVC, and Capabilities Procurement at Anheuser Busch InBev North America. She's uh, she's in that St. Louis, Missouri area. Angie, thank you for joining Dude and Dude on What the Truck today. Hi, thanks for having me. We um <laughs> we so one of our journalists, John Paul Hampstead, he put a great story on FreightWaves.com that was talking about this this twenty million mile challenge and and what you what your team is doing in terms of sustainability. Oh, uh, your your Molly sent us a video of the of the Nikola and what you are doing with uh, electric trucks and hydrogen fuel cells and those kind of things. Let's play that video really quick. Super yeah. excited and thrilled to be here today. Our partnership with Nikola BYD. It's coming to life today. Today, it's the first time we've ever moved freight with the Nikola truck. Inside of the trailer is Bud Light, and we'll be delivering it today. Completely zero emission from beginning to end. The hydrogen is produced through zero emission methods. It's consumed on the vehicle through fuel cells, and now we can move Bud Light with no emissions at all. And that's our goal here is to help allow them to be able to move the freight with uh, uh, knowing that every Bud Light is that much cleaner. BYD's mission is to build the highest quality zero emission vehicles in the world. 21 trucks will be going into service very soon here with Anheuser-Busch to improve the quality of life for local residents and build a better world. I could not be more excited about the results, partnership, innovation and sustainability and what we are achieving together. Angie, that is one beautiful truck, that, that Anheuser-Busch one, <laughs> yeah. the all red. It really is cool. Yeah. So tell us about this. So in 2018, AB announced its sustainability goal for 2025. You have been a part of this, this sustainability team with, with AB for a lot of your career. So, so tell me about that. What, what's happening over on your side? Yeah, absolutely. Now, let me start by saying beer is a very natural product when you think about it. Barley, water, hops, rice, and yeast. Um, since we are so dependent on natural resources and thriving communities. It makes perfect sense that sustainability is so heavily integrated into our business. And so we recognize this very clearly. And yes, in 2018, we launched our new global public goals centered on four major areas. And those are water stewardship, smart agriculture, circular packaging, and renewables and carbon. And I can tell you a little bit about each one of those goals. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Please. Yeah. So if we, if you think about water, it, it takes a lot of water to make beer. It takes perfect water to make perfect beer. Um, we've been working specifically on water conservation for a very long time. And our goal is that 100% of our facilities are engaged in water efficiency efforts. And 100% of our high-risk sites, our production facilities, will have measurably improved water quality and quantity. And so we're working with organizations like the River Network and and PNC on those watershed projects. The second goal, yeah, the second goal is in the agriculture space. I think a lot of people don't think of Anheuser-Busch as an agriculture company in general, Um, but we we are. We work with more than 1,000 direct growers in the U.S., Um, And we buy about 30 million bushels of barley, 17 million bushels of rice, and around 3.5 million pounds of hops every year. So we we definitely are an ag company. And our specific goal there is that 100% of our direct farmers will be highly skilled, connected, and financially empowered. Um, And we're doing this through a, a platform called Smart Barley. Our third goal is around packaging, and in this goal, it's it's really focused on our primary packaging, and that 100% of that packaging material will be made from recycled content or be returnable. And then the last goal, which is probably more of the focus for today, (laughs) is around (laughs) renewables and carbon. Um, And here, we want 100% of our purchased electricity to come from renewables and we're also focused on a 25% reduction in carbon 
Andrew, hold on. I gotta give you. I gotta live you a little cowbell for that, because uh, a little, a little, a little <laughs> cheer for you. Uh, come on, give, give yeah, a cheer. Absolutely. What ABV is doing is awesome. Me. I mean, it's it, amazing. Look, big companies are the leaders, and a big company like this in this space, being a leader in terms of sustainability, carbon neutral, all those kind of things, is is freaking awesome. And I'm so happy to highlight it. She touched briefly on this, right? Uh, how how big is this supply chain, right? You're moving a lot of stuff, a lot of beer, a lot of bottles. We being are. an ad company. Yeah, yeah, no, globally, if you, if you want to think globally for a moment, we operate in more than 50 countries around the world, producing 500-plus um, beer brands. Here in the United States, we have about 100 facilities, um, including breweries, agricultural facilities, action plants. Um, and then we, if we want to talk specifically about transportation, um, we operate within a three-tier system, right, where we're moving beer from our breweries to our wholesalers and then from our wholesalers to our retailers. Um, and in that space, we ship about 800,000 to a million shipments in that, in that tier one space from our breweries to our wholesalers every year. Wow. <laughs> it takes a lot of trucks. <laughs> it takes, it takes, it takes a lot of trucks, and you have a quite a, a large dedicated fleet. So what does that fleet look like in the future? With all your, your different goals that you have, what, what does the fleet look like, the dedicated fleet for AB look like in the future? Yeah, our dream state is zero emission. We, we roughly have about 50% of our shipments, uh, 40 to 50% of our shipments on our dedicated owned fleet today, and the other, you know, 50 to 60% on, on long haul over the road contracts with both asset based and brokerage suppliers. Um, so when we think about what could that dedicated fleet look like, um, as you saw in the in the video, we we have signed. Um, an agreement with Nikola for up to 800 vehicles. And we also have a public arrangement uh, with Tesla uh, for some electric vehicles in our, in our fleet as well. Is there, and I then, mean, you may not be privy to this, but is, is there a reason that, that ABV w would lean more into Nikola over Tesla, or was it just, just the way it was pitched? I, I think it's a, you know, they're complementary. Um, so the, the Tesla vehicles, are more of the shorter range, and, and the Nikola hydrogen will be more geared towards, you know, they can go up to 1,200 miles um, wow. so without refueling. So they would be more of a solution for us in that, those long hauls. So I think they're complementary. And then we're also working with BYD in our, in our Tier 2 system at our wholesalers to deliver to retail, and those are smaller Class 8 electric vehicles that we now, we now have in California. She mentioned a ton of shipments, right, Michael Vince? And I imagine, she, like, that's a lot of... Imagine the paper days of moving Budweiser if you're, like, their freight broker. I imagine that data, though, and, and data transparency has to play a big part. And I think that you're partnering with, with Convoy, if I'm not mistaken, as part of that, that Empty Mile Challenge. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, no, we, with Empty Miles, we, we know we have an opportunity for future emission reductions um, with our backhaul. Um, we have opportunity with digital freight matching where Convoy can help us in batching loads uh, to really reduce our future emissions. Uh, this could lead up to about 20% of our future emission reductions in the transportation space, just that backhaul piece. Um, so if you we think about data, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, please. I thought you were finished. No, I was just going to say if we think about um, data transparency and, and data collaborative partnerships with, with Convoy, they certainly are one of our strategic carriers. Um, and we have about a dozen or so strategic carriers that we work with. Uh, but this is where we can really look at our combined data set to bring a more holistic view to our entire operation. Wow. I mean, yeah, so you're, you're, filling, you're filling those backhaul miles and, and not having them deadhead or empty. That's right. Wow. That's amazing. That'll it's be amazing awesome. amazing stuff. And like, like we said, I mean, leaders, big companies like this, making these changes, they're what force the hand of the market and what force other companies to, to compete. I'm, I'm so glad that, Angie, you're a leader in this initiative, and you seem like a great person to be doing it. I checked out your background on, on LinkedIn. You've been with, with Budweiser for most, mostly your, your entire career, right? How has that journey gone of going to sustainability? It's been incredible. I mean, I've been very lucky and privileged, I think, to have always played a role in our sustainability efforts, even before we, you know, had public goals. So it's, it's been amazing to see the transition, the transformation that, that we've had, but it's, it's even, you know, more uh, 
compelling to see where we're going to go in the future. And these 25 goals are, they're ambitious. We don't know yet exactly how we're going to get there. Uh, but it's, it's great to be able to operate in that dream state. Yeah, aim for the aim for Mars and maybe you'll land on the moon, right? And then you can figure out from there. But at least you're making you're making okay. great progress. You're making fundamental progress. And by the way, I'll say hi to JP for you as he walks by this the, the set over here. <laughs> um, if you want to learn more, go read John Paul Hampstead's article on FreightWaves.com. But NG listeners, where else can listeners go after this? Are there any resources with uh, Anheuser Busch for them to check out about your sustainability goals? There are. I would highly recommend going to PurposeBeyondBrewing.com. Um, where we hope to inspire others to do more. And also, if you just want to learn more about beer, as I'm sure a lot of people mm. do, you can, go, you can go to YouTube and check out Thinking Beer. It's a, a new series that we've been putting out. Yeah, I think uh, I think after this show, um, my co-host here is going to go do some beer study himself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Angie, thank you so much for your time today. This was Angie Slaughter, VP Sustainability Logistics, SBC, thank you, and Capability Procurement at Anheuser-Busch InBev North America. Have a great weekend, Angie. Thank you so much. You too. Cheers. Wow. Excellent stuff they're doing. Cool looking trucks. We're seeing this space, a lot of activity. 2020 has, I mean, there, there's been the COVID and everything, but look at all the stories that we're reporting recently on what uh, electric truck manufacturers are doing, what sustainability is doing. It, we've been reading about, like, 2018, read it seems far off, but now in 2020, we're actually seeing these things happening. Companies putting big money behind these initiatives. Yeah, they are. They really are. And we're, we're seeing that this 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 stress on our society causing a, a quite a big revolution. Yeah. Right. In, in tech, innovation, et cetera. It, it, it's amazing to watch. And these, these electric vehicles, I mean, everything's being accelerated. Yeah. Well, and you as hear so many arguments, too, like it, arguments have become political about about environmentalism, about sustainability. But I mean, it, you can't deny that pollution exists. And it's great to see if, if you know, if politics can't do it or regulators can't do it, you know, young people really want to save the environment. There's a big push amongst Gen Z, and thank you, Gen Z, for wanting to to sort of save the environment, be at the forefront of that stuff. And like we already mentioned, it takes the big companies to do it. It takes the big companies to force the hand of the market to lead the way and to do so. I mean, God bless what ABV is doing. Yeah, amen. It, yeah, amen. It, it, private industry is what's, is what's driving it. But yeah. it, it has to be pushed along at certain points as well. Is Like California is trying to do is push yeah. it along a little bit faster, right? And it'll probably work. Work yeah, and push it, it along. Act as a model. Like, it, there'll be hiccups. Yeah, there will definitely be hiccups. They can't even agree on how this thing is if you're in compliant or not or whatever. But and people are both sides of the. But the fact is, you're exactly right. We're reporting on more and more innovation that is happening, and sometimes it takes that huge stress on the uh, on the uh, on a society to make that happen to move things forward quicker. By the way, the well-named Dooner Livingston said, "Whoa, you play bass? I'm a guitar player myself." I used to be pretty good. Then trucking screwed that up. <laughs> hey, Dooner Livingston, I, first of all, you can come on the show because your name is Dooner. But if you want to play it forward with us on here, just message me on, on LinkedIn. We'll, we'll be happy to have yeah. you at some point in uh, yeah, the summer, have you on the show more than that. You don't happy. have to be good. Plenty of bands proved oh, that. Oh, I'm not any good at playing this cowbell. It doesn't stop me. All right. A little time for a little good news, bad news. I don't have my little bumper thing with me. So I should have brought my, my little son with me here. He could have done yeah, it he for could've. us. But, so here's the bad news. You're driving on Highway 616 in Alberta, Canada on June 24, 2020, when you hit an overpass and spill meat all over the highway. <laughs> right? I mean, and we have, a, we have a couple pictures of this crash. It looks terrible. The uh, user shared it on Facebook. And uh, the good news is that, well, the crash did look severe. You know, the whole thing was crumpled meat all over the place. The driver did survive. He was picked up by the Royal Mounted Police and he was taken to the hospital. They're not sure why it happened. Accident remains under investigation. But if you talk to some of the truckers I talked to, they're saying that it, it would it, they would probably blame a four wheeler. They're saying that now that people are getting out of quarantine and out of self isolation, oh. driving on the roads, they're they're a little crazy. I haven't driven in a while. And you know what? You do lose a little muscle memory. I would imagine you do. There was plenty of people who are driving every day who had no muscle memory, apparently, <laughs> that I saw. I never had any. <laughs> never had any to begin with. Not, not at all. But, yeah, that is, well, I think it's just bad news losing, losing all that meat. But So, bad news. Amazon's marketplace has been hijacked by counterfeit sellers who not only cost businesses money, but also endanger consumers with inferior and unregulated products, right? Yeah. So, I mean, we've seen it. People getting burned by oven mitts, yeah, whatever, you, but right? fake PPEs. You're making the cookies. I'm making it. Yeah, that's right. That's what <laughs> I like. 
like to do. I don't, I don't study beer. I just bake cookies on Friday nights is, is what I do. But fake car seats and medicines and PPEs, we were read about is, all those things. It, it is unforgivable. Yeah. Fake tests for COVID, that yeah. type of stuff. It's, it's really good. Here's the good news. Amazon spent more than $500 million in 2019 uh, thwarting the efforts of the illegal sellers on its site. The company's internal task force as 8,000 strong is was 8,000 strong, uh, blocking more than 2.5 million suspected bad actor accounts before they could list counterfeit products and stopping over 6 billion suspected fraudulent listings. Amazon had launch, uh, announced the launch of an enhanced initiative to combat counter, counterfeiters trying to sell knockoff products through its site. The Counterfeit Crimes Unit is a global initiative staffed by former federal prosecutors, investigators, data, analysts, data, data analysts who will attempt to uh, block counterfeit products. It's good stuff. Yeah. It's yeah, I, it's good that they're reacting to it. It's still all kind of like bad news that you need to do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> John Baglino said that's a lot of muscle memory. Wow. I'm not sure what the meat. The, the meat With the meat, be, yeah. The meat the, could yeah. be muscle memory. Yeah. A lot of protein on the highway over there. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of protein. Sad day for the meat. Well, uh, here's some bad news for mall cops and city tourists. Uh -oh. The Segway is dead. What? The Segway is dead, my man. Yeah. Segway's dead. It's good news, though, for everyone else. Everyone else who thought they were dorky, were not a fan of them. I hated them when I lived in the north end of Boston. They I just saw these... some on a bridge just the other day. They banned them. They banned them like a decade ago in Boston. But like oh, they really? had these Segway tours, and the streets are way too small for these yeah. things. They were like 600 pounds. They go up to like 25 miles an hour. They just like zoom past you. Nobody cares with their goofy helmets on. And it's kind of a sad <laughs> story, too. So they've been around since 2001. I got a trivia question. Do you know how many Segways they've sold since 2001? Audience, too, in the comments. What do you think? I have no idea. No idea? Is the answer in here? No. No, because then <laughs> you would have guessed. All right, time's up. 140,000 in like 20 years. So that's not very good. That, that's not a lot. <laughs> not very good. Not very good. Not so, yeah, so Mr. No, Wonderful it, would say, take it out back and shoot it. It's a dog. There is a, there's a sad, it's kind of a sad story, though. I mean, the, the, uh, the former millionaire owner of the Segway from Jimmy Heseldon, he died in a tragic accident. He was riding one of these Segway scooters on his estate, and he ended oh, up driving it right off a cliff. Don't laugh. <laughs> he drove, I mean, you know, it's too it's soon. All, I mean, it was a decade ago. But. It was 10 years <laughs> it was ago. ago. That, that's awful. Is there just, there's something like, like a poetic irony is there? Is that what you're laughing at? Yeah, kind of, no. yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't laugh at people driving off cliffs. Yeah, Unless it's no. Bill Murray and Groundhog's Day. That's no, hilarious. Of course, not. of course not. Of course not. Hey, so it, it's been a great show today. Thank you to all of our guests. Coming up on Monday on Want the Truck, we have Mitch Lucchino. He's from Trailer Bridge. You know what's coming back, though? Lance Healy. He's one oh. of the guys. He's one of the reasons that we started Play It For because yeah. he just ripped our, wrecked our faces with the harmonica, right? Yeah, just, it wasn't even pre-planned. We just said, hey, no. he said, hey, I play it. I got one in my pocket right now. I just whipped it out. I know, out. and then, then, that, went, then it dawned on us, oh, maybe a lot of listeners yeah. do play and would be willing to do that. So we, we started him. He's going to play us the blues harp this time. That's going to be that's going to be freaking awesome. All right. Right. He's I with Van Yeno. We got Joel Watuka. He's also going to join us. He's going to talk about uh, using your, your platform in times like this, especially logistics, putting the right messaging out there. Uh, very important time to have this conversation and uh, looking forward to talking to him as well as truck driver Nathan Lewis. He's going to play it forward as well. Driving on the road. Like we said, play an instrument. Reach out to us. Dune on the dude at Timothy Duner on the Twitter as D-O-O-N-E-R or continue the conversation on LinkedIn. He's Michael Vincent right over there. That's right. Vincent the dude. Yeah. Subscribe to the show on, on what you can look up what the truck on your favorite podcast player yep. or subscribe to Freight Cast. Get every single Freightways podcast, including the midday market update, which happens at noon. Noon every single day, by the way, Monday through Friday at noon. There is a live show. There's a live show That's on right. Freight Waves LinkedIn, Freight Waves Facebook. You can watch these things. You can listen to them afterwards on Freight Cast. You can subscribe to them on your on whatever podcast player you use biggest in the world. <laughs> Norm go this weekend, Chickamauga Battlefield. What do you think of that place? I think that'd be awesome. Yeah, that's where I'm going. You gonna go okay. check it? Have you ever been? Uh, no, no, I haven't been yet. Wow, seems All like right. a good place to go in these COVID times. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd yeah. be cool. Uh, so I got, a, I had a golf game interrupted by Dick Cheney in Air Force. I guess it's Air Force Two when he's on it, coming out of uh, Chattanooga would, uh, for the the anniversary of it. He had a great grandfather or something that was in the Battle of Chickamauga. Wow. Yeah. Did he landed. He didn't land on the battlefield, did he? No, no, no. Right here in Chattanooga. Though. All right. Take it easy, everybody. Peace and love. Bye, Luke Calvin, for everybody out there. Have a great weekend. We love you.